The opinions expressed by the host and guests on Where Did the Road Go are their own and do not represent those of WVBR or its management. Our aim is to explore the fringe, lost civilizations, alternative science, the paranormal, and much more. Join us on the web at WhereDidTheRoadGo.com, where you can send us questions for our live or future guests via email or the live chat room. And remember to subscribe to us on iTunes. And now welcome to this week's edition of Where Did The Road Go? And I am your host, Soraya, as always, and... Uh, this week we have a very interesting guest. His name is Albert Taylor. He's written a book called Soul Traveler back in the mid-90s. And uh, he's also done some work with robotics and uh, has a bit of a scientific background that I'm going to let him talk to you about. Hello, Albert. Welcome to the show. Oh, well, thank you. It's a pleasure to be here. Now, uh, you, uh, you want to tell people a little bit about your scientific history before we get into everything else? Well, um, I guess I, I've been always interested in things that fly. I guess since uh, early age, but um, I, I joined the U U.S. Air Force at 17, um, and um, I went through tech school, um, became an aircraft um, uh, maintenance uh, specialist mechanic. Uh, I ended up becoming a crew chief on the Lockheed U-2. Um, I, I had, I, of course, to work on the U-2 in the Air Force, you have to have a secret clearance, so that opened up the door to uh, a lot of secret DOD programs that I was exposed to. As soon as I got out of the military, um, I got um, um, kind of recruited by Lockheed Skunk Works, where I became an engineer on the uh, stealth fighter before anybody knew it existed. And um, then I left um, the uh, Lockheed Skunk Works, and I ended up working for Rockwell International, which was Rockwell's now, um, I think, Boeing. And I was doing designing uh, the rotary launch control system for the B-1B, the flight controls for the B-1B, the uh, and landing gear for the B-1B. And then um, I left. Uh, well, I transferred from that to um, Rockwell Seal Beach uh, Le Electronic Space Division, and I helped design GPS before anybody knew about GPS. Mm. And I, I worked on, uh, because I had a clearance, um, that was around the time of um, President Reagan's Star Wars program. So I ended up working on some satellites and some programs and stuff in the uh, uh, FBI Strategic Defense Initiative program. And um, let's see, then I left there because um, the space station was be, had been funded, and I left and I became an engineer scientist on the International Space Station, and I was responsible for the airlock, um, which the astronauts used for extravehicular activity. I was responsible for the pressurized mating adapter, which the shuttle would dock to the space station with, and I was responsible for the command and control node, which all the other nodes kind of plug into it, and it's the where all the computers, and it's pretty much the headquarters of the space station. Wow. So, um, <laughs> so I, I, I did that, and then while I, all that was going on, um, I was keeping a journal, a diary of some very strange things that was happening to me that I didn't think were related in any way, shape, or form. I really kind of thought I was, I was losing it. I thought I was going crazy, and I figured um, if, if I was losing it, somebody was going to find my journal when I was babbling in the corner, <laughs> drooling, and they'd read how I got there. That's good. I kind of figured. I thought, okay. Because they, but the only thing that anchored, the thing that kept me from really thinking it was insanity or, or something like that is because it was happening to more than me. It was happening to several people in my family. So, you know, being a researcher myself, of course, and, and the worst thing you can do is do research on yourself. <laughs> but, you know, but looking at that analytical uh, um, process of, of that, I started thinking maybe it was neurological, which is, you know, a logical way. If it's in my family and where I'm having it, then it's, it's got to be neurological because it can't really be genetic. You know, genes don't necessarily do that. Right. But, and, and it was happening to some strangers. Too, so I knew that was you know I thought it was something like that. So I, I I elected to take a battery of physical tests, mental tests, all kinds of things, trying to find the source of this problem, what I thought was a problem, which was 
repeated night paralysis and and vibration and loud noises at night and hearing my name being called and all kinds of bizarre stuff that goes along with with night paralysis and I got a clean bill of health from all my doctors so that's when I decided well what happened was what it, it um, normally throughout my entire life I get night paralysis maybe about once a week and that's just been the way it is and so it, it you know it's it's part of my life you, you want to explain pardon? that to people a little bit what the night paralysis well, night, is Night paralysis is when you go to sleep at night normally, and you 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 go to sleep, and then sometime during the the, the night you uh, you may wake up, and where you're alert and but you can't move your physical body, and it's it can be frightening. You feel like sometimes you feel like you can't breathe. Um, you may hear loud noises like a buzzing or electrical charge type of sound. Uh, you may hear voices. You may hear someone call your name. Um, the bed may feel like it's vibrating. Um, you also may feel as if you're sinking into the bed, like as if you weigh, you know, two or three times more than you do. Um, so all of these things can happen, or any one or two of these things can happen. And in my life, because my, my family has experienced it, they talked about this as being the witches coming to ride you because you were bad the day before or something. So that was their explanation of it. So in that they no, no one ever talked about out-of-body experiences or astral projection or any of that, those type of things when I was a kid. You know, I, I, I went to Catholic school. Catholic school doesn't talk about that at all. Right. You know, and matter of fact, if you start talking about that openly, then they condemn it. You know, it's just not of God, it's of the devil. That's, and that's the, you pretty much answer to anything that is unknown that a kid could ask. So growing up with that kind of support system, to, for lack of a better phrase, yeah. <laughs> you know, it's a wonder that any of us outside of a metaphysical background or, or upbringing would even be exposed to this. And, and the only thing aspect we are exposed to is the ignorance, and I mean that lovingly, of other people, meaning they don't know what it is, so they give you an explanation that they think is or that someone told them, and they pass this this fear tool, this tool of fear, uh, down through generations. That's going to keep you from exploring it. So you'll never, you may live and die, literally, and people have not having the slightest clue what this thing is, what this, uh, the answers to this mystery that I discovered, you know, regarding night paralysis. Now, how did you how did you learn more about what was happening to you? Pardon me. How did you learn more about what was happening to you? Well, what I did is um, when I went, after I got a clean bill of health, I decided to do experiments on myself because, like I was saying, it usually happens about once a week. But then all of a sudden, it went from once a week to three times a night. Mm. So three times a night, and then several times a week. So it was a lot. I mean. I would get into the night for acids, fight my way out of it, and then lay down and then go right back into it again. So I just decided I'm going to write down what's going on. So the first thing I noticed is that it would happen uh, uh, after I was really tired and on the nights that I seemed to have eaten uh, an early dinner. I thought, okay, this, I wrote that down. Not, I didn't know if it was related, but I wrote it down because I was looking for uh, uh, similarities and, and, and re repeat uh, uh, happenings, occurrences. You know, that's what research is all about. You try to repeat, you know, an experiment. And so, um, I, so when I would ha it would happen, I noticed that I would hear, I would first like feel the um, the vibration, and then I would uh, I would start hearing this loud buzzing. I mean, very loud, so loud that if it was normal, it probably would damage your eardrums. That's mm -hmm. how loud it is. But it wasn't painful in that state, that that altered state of consciousness. It was just extremely loud, and. But but the thing about the uh, the vibration that I would hear, it wasn't random. It seemed to be like an oscillation, like a, a frequency. And that was kind of interesting, and that's important, too. 
because there's a lot um, regarding out-of-body experiences and the second body or the astral body, as people call, call it, that has to do with vibration and frequency. And that's why you feel, so, you know, I would wake up, I would have um, these episodes of uh, feeling like the bed was shaking when I'd go into this altered state, too, because what happens is matter and your physical matter is vibrating. It's just vibrating at a very, very low rate. So when you go into these altered states of consciousness, your consciousness kind of moves into a higher vibrational state. It could be the second body, as Robert Monroe called it, or it could be the astral body, as a lot of metaphysicians call it. Or, or, or it could be going exterior, as I think um, uh, the, uh, the L. Ron Hubbard uh, 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 group calls it. So that's what happens is when you transfer from that lower state of vibration to a higher state, you feel vibration. And that's what I discovered. The thing about it is, you, is to some degree, you have a con control over that. So that's what I was doing is during a 10-day period of time as I was experimenting with meditation, relaxation, increasing, decreasing vibration, and I started having literally out-of-body experiences. Not, not that I hadn't had them before, but I'd never had them from actually trying to accomplish it and not falling asleep normally and waking up in the middle of the night and having them to going from being able to relax my physical body and uh, blank out my mind and slip into this vibrational state and actually have what I was having, uh, having these exterior or these experiences. Now, let me, I gotta say this. I didn't know they were out of body experiences. I didn't know the name of that. Um, astro projection, I thought it was astro like the dog on the Jetsons. I had no idea what astro was. So I wasn't thinking that's what I was doing. One of the things that I've been doing all my life since I was five years old is I've been having lucid dreams, but I didn't know that's what it was called. I would tell my mother when I was five, I'd say, Mom, I wake up in my dreams and I fly. So that's what I've been doing all my life is I would control my dreams. And I thought it was a normal thing. I never thought it was anything other than normal. And it was just like my, my time to have fun. I knew I could do it. I did it all the time, so that's what I thought this was, having lucid dreams. I didn't know they were connected to out-of-body experiences or even reality. Mm -hmm. I thought once I opened my eyes from having this experience, it was just a dream, and that's it. It was, had nothing to do with reality. So, one, one t so I, I told a friend, I was at the space station at that time, uh, um, and I told a friend, and I don't know why I trusted her, because I didn't want to let this out to anybody, because you gotta, I got to remind people that here I was training astronauts at Johnson Space Center on how to assemble the space station in orbit. So the last thing I was going to do is tell someone that I was having you know, leaving my body and <laughs> hearing voices, and I was not going to mention that to anybody at my job. Right. And I'd been there, I'd had, you know, I'd had a secret clearance, too, for 27 years. So I'm not going to risk anything that has to do with my career whatsoever, you know. But I shared it with a friend, and she said to me, she said, there's a psychiatrist, doctor, uh, and she's... She had a near-death experience, which I wasn't very familiar with near-death experiences at the time. And she said she has, she teaches a class at the local college on this type of phenomenon, and you might want to go and talk to her and teach, take her class. So, real, you know, I'm a scientist now. I'm, I'm real skeptical, and I'm going, oh, I don't know about that stuff, you know. <laughs> and, and I don't want to waste my money on that. And, it, you know, I'm, I, I didn't believe in it. I have to say that. Uh, and I, I didn't disbelieve in it, but I, I lean more to not than, than you know, toward it. Right. So I took the class anyway because I'm trying to gather information, be it for, uh, uh, information that takes me off on the wrong track tempor temporarily or something that I could use. So I went down there, and I was sitting in the class, and about 10 minutes into the class, she asked a question that no one outside of my family had ever even addressed. I had ever heard anyone talk about. And she says, has anybody ever gone to sleep at night and felt paralyzed at night? Mm -hmm. And I'd never heard anybody outside of my family talk about it because it was a witch rise in my family. Right. So when she said it, I was like, oh my God, you know, there is a reason I'm here. And I, my hand shot up in the air and I was like waving around. So yeah, <laughs> it happens to me almost every night now. 
And she looked at me, and she was the very first person in my life to say, you may be on the verge or you may be having out-of-body experiences. No one had ever said that to me before. And when, but when she said it, I laughed because I said, I don't believe in that stuff. And she said, you can't tell me what you don't know. And I thought, oh, okay, well, she said, I'll tell you what, when you, the next time it happens to, to you, she said, think about seeing me and think about me and, and ask to see me, say it literally, I want to see and say my name and see what happens. I thought, okay. So of course, it didn't take long for me to wait to see what was gonna happen. Um, that night or the night, the next night, it had happened again, like it had been happening several times throughout, throughout the week. And um, one of the things that was different is that I, I felt myself, I thought I was leaning my head against the headboard, you know, like I was sleeping in a prone on my back. Right. And then when I started relaxing, the headboard started moving and it started moving downward. I could feel it literally sliding down the top of my head. And I thought, wait a minute, I know my bed isn't moving. And then this was really interesting, is all of a sudden I could see, but I didn't open my eyes. And another thing I noticed is that I wear glasses normally. Mm -hmm. And I knew I hadn't gone to sleep with my glasses on, but I could see the room real clear, clearer than I normally can physically, with, you know, without my glasses. And I thought, that's odd. And then something else I noticed. I, I noticed that from the perspective that I was at, I could see, you know, normally, normally my, my television is at the foot of my bed. And if I'm laying flat on my back, I can only see about the top two thirds of my television because part of it is below the, the bed. So I have to sit up in my bed to look at the entire screen. But what I noticed about this perspective that I was at is that not only could I see the, t the entire television screen, but I could see where the television touched the floor. Hmm. And I thought, I, I thought, well, this, this is kind of weird. And then I noticed another thing is that the light in the room, uh, normally if there were moonlight or starlight or something like that, it would come in through the window and illuminate everything. So it was one, you know, it had a single source. But what I noticed looking around the room is everything in the room had its own kind of light, which was another thing that was odd. So I thought, while I was there, I thought, okay, what did the doctor say? She said, oh, yeah, ask, ask to see her. And so that's what I did. And this never happened before this time is I said, I want to see, and I'll call her Dr. H. I want to see Dr. H. And all of a sudden, I felt like hand, uh, two hands on, on my, on my forearms, on my, on my bicep, both biceps, not hurting me, just kind of steering me. That had never happened before, startled me. Um, and it started pushing me toward the window. Um, and it, it was really strange going through the window. It's kind of felt like if you've ever been in a bathtub and you've had bubbles in the bathtub and you stick your finger in the bubble and it doesn't Pop, but it adheres to your finger. Mm -hmm. That's what the glass felt like going through it. It was really strange. And then I noticed that I started accelerating really, really fast and um, climbing up into uh, to the sky. And I'd never done I'd done this many times in lucid dreams as that as I began to learn what they were. But I'd never done this from meditating, relaxing, vibration, and flying. And when I did this that night, it all came together because I realized while I was flying, oh my God, this is what I've been doing all my life. This is no different. It is exactly the same thing, except I never began it like this. So one of the things I, I noticed is that I didn't have control of the direction I was heading, but I had control of the speed and the altitude. So I began to experiment with that, and I'd go faster, I mean, and faster than I'd ever traveled in my life. I'd go higher, and I'd experiment with that. And then soon I realized I was being drawn to and down to a, I could see rooftops, I could see uh, trees. I was coming into a neighborhood I'd never been to. Uh, I literally, I thought I was gonna crash into the roof, but I found myself penetrating through the roof and then next, I could see insulation in the attic that, uh, as I was coming down through the roof, and, and I could see wires, and then next thing I know, 
I'm, and I'm still thinking I'm dreaming, though. I wasn't thinking this was an autobiography experience at all. all. You know, and I didn't really care because I was having fun. <laughs> and I found myself at the foot of a bed of, of the, the doctor and that I, you know, that, in my, that I took a class. And I thought, okay, well, this is an interesting dream. And so I'm looking around, and I knew she was married, but I didn't know her and her husband slept in two different beds. And I noticed there were bunk, um, twin beds in the room. And I thought, okay, that's interesting. But not only was there another bed in the room, but it was way over on the other side of the room, and someone was in it. And I thought, okay, if I'm really here, that's a good thing to remember. And then I looked at her in the bed, and she was sleeping, and then I, I, kinda, I noticed that what it would look like to me, like she had a cast on her leg. And I thought, okay, I don't remember hurting her leg, but if she did hurt her leg, that's a good thing to remember. So I kind of felt like, <laughs> I, always, I always describe it as an astral cat burglar. So I felt like maybe I, maybe I, over, I shouldn't be here. And I thought, I want to go back. And with that, I felt the hands again, and the room like it's accelerated away from me at an incredible rate of speed. Um, I, I felt extreme acceleration. And the next thing I knew, I felt like I was being dropped from the ceiling in my bedroom onto, <coughs> excuse me, All dropped right. from the ceiling, dropped from the ceiling onto my bed. And I woke up with a jolt. And when I woke up, I was vibrating like crazy. I mean, it was just, I thought there was an earthquake. The vibration was so strong. And one of the things is hanging from my ceiling is a ceiling fan. And I have one of those little tassels, and that's kind of my Richter scale. So when I, you know, I live in California, and we have earthquakes all the time. I was born here, so it's not a big deal to me. Right. But one of the things that happens is when there is an earthquake, that little tassel tells me what degree it is, the intensity. <laughs> <laughs> so, nice. but I noticed that while I was laying there in the bed, vibrating like crazy, that tassel wasn't moving. And I thought, okay, that's strange. So I grabbed my journal, and I went to walk in the house, and I started writing all this down. So the, that was Saturday. On Monday, I couldn't wait to get into class to, take the, to see the teacher, the doctor, that, that, you know, that I thought I had, I had had a dream about. Right. And so that, that Monday, I'm sitting in class on pens and needles, literally, because I can't wait to talk to her. And at the break, I went up to her, and I said, Doctor, I said, Something really interesting happened to me this weekend. And she said, before I could say anything else, she said, you know, she said, it's really interesting that you did that something happened to you. She said, because I had a dream that you were standing at, um, she said, on Saturday, I had a dream that you were standing at the foot of my bed. And I thought to my, I didn't tell her. I hadn't told her anything. I thought, well, is that a coincidence? And then I said, you know, I said, I had a dream that I was there too. And I said, but... And I looked at her leg, and her leg, it looked fine, no cast or anything. And I said, but I said in, in the dream that I had, though, one, that I saw you, I said, it looked like you broke your leg and you had a cast on your leg. And she says, no, she says, but I do wear a white heating pad on my knee because I have arthritis in my knee, and it, it hurts at night. And I thought, yeah. okay, that's interesting. And then I said, well, I knew you, you I said, I won't be too personal, but in my dream, I know you're married, but... I didn't know you and your husband in my dream. You were, he was way on the other side of the room, which was kind of odd. And she says, he is on the other side of the room because my husband has sleep apnea, and when he's, he's, he keeps me up at night, so I move him way on to the other uh, side of the room where I can barely hear him. Hmm. And I thought, oh, my God. It, it, you know, so I went home that night, and you got to remember, I never heard about any of this stuff. <laughs> and so I'm, I'm going home... And, and it's not about somebody telling me this happened anymore. It's not about someone reading it in a book somewhere and sharing it with me. It's about me having this personal experience that I can't explain because there's a rational, uh, analytical side of me that doesn't, you know, needs proof and doesn't necessarily believe, would believe in this kind of thing. And then there's an experiential part of me that has been having this all, experience all my life that didn't know what it was. Right. So it wasn't an alien. So, you know, it's not like it's new. It's something that I didn't know that's what that was. <laughs> <laughs> you know? So that's what made me think. I started, my mind began to run amok. 
I started thinking, oh my God, life after death, what are we that we can, what, what are we that we can do these things? And, and Catholic school that always talked about, we have a soul, like it was something you have in your pocket that you can walk around in it, like a handkerchief, and it gets dirty <laughs> once in a while, and you take it to the priest, and you say, you know, Father, my handkerchief, my soul is dirty, and he gives you a couple of prayers, and you clean it up, and you go back out to the world. That's kind of like what the soul was. It was an, an, a possession of some sort. It wasn't you. It wasn't your consciousness. It wasn't everything that made you what you are. I, that's what I was told and taught. But these experiences started making me wonder what was that part of me that could leave the physical and move off and see something that I should not have known anything about. I couldn't explain how come I knew about her heating pad. I couldn't explain about how come her husband was on the other side of the room. So I wanted to do it again. And I told, do we need to take a break? <laughs> no, no. Uh, I was going to say the uh, the fact that she saw you there kind of confirms that it wasn't just you, like, psychically or remote viewing or something like that. The fact that she had a dream that you were there kind of gives you a little more that you were actually out of the body rather than, you know, seeing it at a distance. Exactly. And and, and because of that, that made me more, uh, it made it more of a puzzle because I wasn't looking for God, astral projection, out-of-body experiences, metaphysics, none of that. I wasn't looking for any of that. I was looking to solve a neurological, maybe hereditary <laughs> issue. Right. And that's kind of it. So now she's telling me, she's seeing me, which is a coincidence on the same date that I saw her, and I'm flying, which was similar to what I've been doing since I was five, and all these things, are they're not random anymore. <laughs> they're starting to fit together. And in a way that I'd never, ever heard of or never been exposed to. But something that was intriguing and beginning to be kind of exciting, you know, Mm -hmm. (laughs) that, wow, is there another reality? Is there something else going on that my five senses can't really, you know, reveal to me right now in a waking state? And, And if so, how big does it get? (laughs) <laughs> How big is this picture of this non-physical reality, alter state consciousness? How big does it get? Does it go to, um, um, we, we live beyond death, as, as she talked about in her near-death experience? Does it go beyond um, the afterlife into heaven or Valhalla or you know, reincarnation? Where does it go? How far does it go? Especially being a scientist, and I'm working on a project right now, research that I call the Cosmic Soul, is one of the things that, you know, I I had that kid asking myself is how far does it go forward, or will it go forward, meaning in time, Mm -hmm. linear time, and how far does it go back? Meaning, how far has there been man reporting things like my life flashed before my eyes when they had like near death like experiences right. or or how far back did uh, someone say I thought I saw a ghost or a spirit or how far back does that go and that's what began to fuel everything that I've been doing and continue to do since then is to find out what's the big story what you know I, I really believe that um, out of body experiences is just the tip of the iceberg and I believe paranormal investigation is just the tip of the iceberg. I believe there's something else going on about us, who we are, and everything else that goes beyond. And I think that we've limited ourselves by placing time limits and time frames on, on this, this non-physical, uh, um, paranormal, um, uh, metaphysical uh, um, Altered, altered consciousness or altered state of consciousness. Right. By us saying, you know, like I read about, and I was in London, and 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 and, and it's a, I was reading and talking to people there where they talk about castles and spirit hauntings and things like that that go back three, four, up to five to six hundred years. Well, five to six hundred years is nothing. I mean, I was in Egypt, and you know the history of Egypt. Right. We're talking three thousand, so. What, did, what happened, like, all of a sudden, just 500 years, we were able to be ghosts? 
<laughs> you know, right? It just it just happened just you know a couple hundred years, but all the thousands. I mean, I think man has been on the planet a little over a million years or so in this present incarnation. You know, the um, Homo sapiens sapiens. Right. But so so when did we become? You know, able to become ghosts. When did we? Uh, when were we able to have out of body experiences? When did this begin? And that's and because I've all the researchers and all the um, places and places I've talked to and lectured, they all seem to put this limit on us. And I think that that is what's going to keep us from finding out what's really going on here is by placing a limitation on the forward and the back. And that's what I've been working on trying to remove because, uh, and it's fueled by my personal experiences. If I hadn't had personal out of experiences that I thought, I didn't care if I'd ever shared this with anybody else. I needed to know the answer about me. And I needed to know the answer about my family. And, and my book, which was, is a miracle in itself because it ended up becoming a number one times bestseller, it's my diary, it's my journal. That's what it is. Yeah. I wasn't setting out to write a book, and I wasn't going to show it to anybody. But as it began to grow, and I began to learn more about what this phenomenon was, and changing me, who I, how I looked at myself, I realized that, oh my God, I can't keep this information to myself. I have to share it with somebody else out there who's suffering or afraid or experiencing this and, and has no, no direction or any clue. You know, I, I, it's a must. It wasn't given to me to hoard. I had to. And that's when I decided to borrow money, and <laughs> I was selling copies of my book literally out of my trunk of my car. Huh. And, and, and people thought I was crazy. I mean, and I understand that, too. I mean, I left, I left uh, the space station to, to promote a self-published book. <laughs> no one had ever heard. I was an engineer scientist. I wasn't a writer. No one ever heard of me. I'm, I was Al from L.A. But <laughs> because this experience had so profoundly impacted me and changed me, I mean, it really changed me. I'm not even close to the person I used to be. Uh, it changed me so much. And this became so important. Matter of fact, probably the most important thing in my life that I had to do if nothing else, you know, um, all your life, you probably, you know, I'd, I'd experience, I'd, I'd worked on some incredible programs. I'd worked on uh, something to protect Air Force One from um, terrorist launch missiles. I worked, I, so I, I worked on amazing from the space station and on that, on amazing programs, and I always loved that, but there was still something inside of me that said, you were, there's something else you needed to do. And for the, and, and for the first time in my life, having published this book and sharing this about with other people who need, who wanted this information was the first time in my entire life that I ever felt that I actually found what I came here to do. Mm. And I you know, and that was a blessing in, in itself because I knew thousands of people who were still searching for that and only a handful who were blessed to have found it. So when that happened, it became everything to me. And, um, the, you know, how could a diary become a bestseller? That's crazy. <laughs> that doesn't make any sense. But the thing is, is that what really uh, impacts me is that people all over the world are sharing with me their own personal experiences that no longer have to, that are dependent on what I share, what I say, or what I've done. They, they, they've opened up doors to their own identities and embraced it. And it has, it, it's living beyond me. It's, it has a life of its own. And that, to me, uh, if nothing else happens beyond today, and that's all I've accomplished, my God, that feeds my soul. I couldn't ask for anything more. Awesome. But there seems to be more going on, and, and it's just this amazing uh, thing that I'm uh, allowed to be a part of that I'm sharing with people about uh, out-of-body experiences, the paranormal. Um, I'm, I'm introducing, because I, I'm, I'm a scientist and, I, and I'm also, I like to build robots, I've introduced exploring the paramor paranormal using autonomous robots. And well, I'm just trying to unfold and, and gather as much knowledge as I possibly can on who and what we really are. All right, okay, we got to take a quick 45-second break. We'll be right back with Albert Taylor.
The opinions expressed by the host and guests on Where Did the Road Go are their own and do not represent those of WVBR or its management. Join us on the web at wheredidtheroadgo.com where you can send us questions for our live guests via email or the live chat room. You can also check out our upcoming schedule, blog, link section, book reviews, videos, and links to our Twitter, Facebook, iTunes, and much more. That's wheredidtheroadgo.com. And we've been talking with Albert Taylor tonight about, uh, well, mostly we've been getting into out-of-body experiences, but uh, as you just brought up, you're, uh, you've kind of mixed your two worlds where you're now building robots to investigate the paranormal. Well, it, yeah, and, you know, and that's another thing is I, I seem to be going down a little bit different path than a lot of my uh, colleagues who investigate the paranormal. And I think that has to do, matter of fact, I know it has a lot to do with my background. You know, I worked in the, you know, the space program for a long, long time. And one of the things that is a no-brainer in, in NASA programs is that you explore the unknown with, ro with robots. You know, that's what NASA does. So it didn't make any sense for me not to explore the paranormal with robots. It, it, you know, yeah. it's the, uh, one of the most logical ways of gathering information. And what it does also is it increases what I call uh, TOS, which is time on station. And that's how long can you be at a particular uh, location where maybe there's something paranormal going on. Usually, people go out with their, their ghost-busting uh, ghost kids, mm -hmm. and they'll maybe, at the most, maybe the, you know, they'll, they'll spend the night or they'll spend two hours, two or three hours, moving around location, and then they leave. Well, the thing about that is that I call it that needle in a haystack uh, investigation. Mm -hmm. And the reason I call it that is because in a 24-hour period, that's just a 24-hour period, let's say something paranormal happens for a minute and 30 seconds. But it only happens in a minute and 30 seconds in that 24-hour period. So and it happens in the fourth hour. But you show up in the sixth hour and you stay to the eighth hour. Right. You're never going to find it. And you leave, and then it happens the next day. You have no clue that it happens that, or there's a pattern. Or, you ha or, or if you do stumble upon it, the pattern, it's going to be by accident. Mm -hmm. So what a robot does, especially an autonomous robot, one that can operate on its own, which my, I have... I have one with, uh, most all mine have microcontrollers, which are brains, that you program. And with a robot that you can program on its own, especially one that's capable of recharging, like, like one of the ones I have is it can uh, recharge with solar energy and ambient light, it can stay on the station as long as the hardware holds together. Wow. So what happens is, is that you increase... The, the maybe the film or, or uh, video or audio uh, that you collect from just that little two to three hours or six hours at the most to a 24-hour period. Now, does the robot... So what that does is it increases your chances of finding something. Right. Does the robot actually respond when it notices something change or is it just kind of collecting data the whole time? No, it has uh, motion detectors, it has night vision, uh, it can sense movement, um, it can go toward that movement, um, it, it knows if you're in the room, if you walk into the room, it'll know you're there. Huh. Um, no, it's, it's really, this, you know, this is, uh, I'd say, my third or fourth generation um, paranormal investigative robot. I have three of them. But I just completed another one uh, that's called uh, Servo. It not, and not only is it the, uh, it has two brains in it. It's the first robot that I've built with two microcontrollers, advanced microcontrollers. So it has two brains, so it's twice as smart as, as any bot I've ever hmm. built. And that makes it capable of accomplishing and doing more things on its own. And the thing is, is that I built the bot so that it's, more advanced than I am. So it has more capability than I'm capable of programming. So I have to learn to catch up with it. Huh. So that's kind of how it's designed. So, so anything I can come up with, given that, 
it can pretty much do. If I wanted to stay on station, if I wanted to send, and matter of fact, it even sends data wirelessly to wherever I am. So I can be in a base station somewhere on a cot taking a nap, and it will be sending me data that will be recording without me even getting involved. Well, one of the things I always wondered about paranormal phenomena is how much the human component matters. Like, how much of this stuff manifests because there's a human consciousness there for it to interact with. Have you been able to catch interesting stuff with the robots? Uh, definitely. And, and there's a positive and a negative to human involvement. Um, the negative is that we sometimes go into paranormal investigative situations wanting to see something. We right. have a desire. Right. So we kind of cause or lean toward or filter data that's coming, that we gather in that situation to lean toward what we want. That's a mistake, a huge, huge mistake, but it happens. And that's where it takes a really good, I think, team leader to keep everybody on track. Mm -hmm. You know, and then that's where a lot of other uh, paranormal investigators go wrong when they do that. Um, another thing is that we can interpret the data wrong, and the human does, collects it and interprets it wrong. Uh, robots don't have that problem. They not, they're not trying to lean the data in any particular direction. They're not trying to, in, they're digitizing the data. They're not trying to interpret it. It is what it is. So going back to your question, have I captured something? Yes, I've captured something that is truly, I think, is amazing. And um, what happened was uh, a couple years ago, I got called by a realtor. Um, and the realtor said, she said, something, I have these, I sell houses, and there's this 100-year-old home that I'm trying to sell here in, out here in Rialto, California. And I have a, a guy who goes and cleans my houses for me and gets them ready for sale. Something happened to him. He went to this house, and something scared him so bad. I've been working with him for years. Something scared him so bad that he refuses to go back to that house. And this has never happened before. So she said, I wanted to know if you guys can go there and find out what's going on or find out there's nothing going on so that I can reassure him it's okay. So I thought, all right. So what she was, now, I don't know if anybody knows this, but California has a really esoteric kind of law that is in realty, realty that if you suspect that a house is haunted, you have to tell the buyer, the huh. new buyer. Yeah, <laughs> which is kind of odd if you think about, you know, being a, a, a law which kind of like the state kind of recognizes the paranormal but doesn't. Right. But the, the state is like that. It, it is kind of hypocritical when it comes to hypocritical in, in those areas because the state actually owns and it boasts here in Southern California. You ever heard of the Whaley House? Uh huh. Yes. Okay. The, the state owns that house and it also boasts that that is one of the top 25 haunted places in the United States. Mm -hmm. So, see, the state kind of walks that. If it benefits you or, you know, it has that, that gray area regarding the paranormal. Right. So she, she's not hoping that there is anything paranormal going on, of course, because she has to sell this place, right? Yeah. So she has her motive. I don't, I'm going to whatever. So we go there. We set up uh, uh, our robots and, and our stat static uh, cameras. And to make a long story short, you, you can see my team go through this doorway. And, um, and uh, matter of fact, um, we uh, we found a hidden stair uh, cave, uh, you know, a passageway behind the stairwell too. In this place, it was amazing. But you wow. see us go through this doorway, and we, you see about seven of us walk up the stairs. And about twenty seconds later, this the upper torso. Now this was, this is what it looked like. <clears throat> Imagine the upper torso and the shoulder, and maybe the side of the head made out of saran wrap that you could barely see moving at the height that the torso and head would be at. It moved through the doorway right behind us and kind of toward us, as, I mean, and kind of followed us toward the staircase. Hmm. I got about, and I, I kept playing, I'm, I must have watched that, I don't know, 500 times, <laughs> because I kept looking for what that could possibly be and trying to explain it away, because that's, I don't want to, we don't jump, to, my group, we don't jump to conclusions right. at all. You know, that's one of the things we do not do. 
but I could not explain it away. I still have not been able to explain it away. I can't explain why, why it looks humanoid. I can't explain why it's moving behind us, why it looks like you, you, you got a glimpse of, of a, a transparent person. Not, not full. You know, I mean, we want a full, everybody wants a full form humanoid, you know, apparition oh, sure. captured on film. That's the holy grail. <laughs> but, it's the tor- but it's the torso, which is an amazing find. And since then, um, I've invested with the robots. They are so amazing. I mean, I don't, they haven't, let me back up a little bit. They have not replaced team members. It's enhanced my overall team. Mm, okay. So, it, yeah, I don't replace people. I still, humans can do things robots can. The humans are still, one of the things, especially, you know, and I think this has a lot to do with my own personal experience. I know that I have these paranormal experience. I have out-of-body experiences. Whether anybody believes me or not, it doesn't matter because it's my reality. It happens to me, yeah. and I've accepted it. So I know, given my own personal experience, humans, we human souls, whatever you want to call us, have these abilities to sense the paranormal or sense non-physical. I've heard voices. I've seen the physical. I've, heard my, I've had experience with my aunt and so on and on. So I know that. So that makes us alone a valuable tool during paranormal investigation. As long as you don't jump to conclusions, right. we are really, really good at sensing non-physical anomalies, okay? So we're valuable. And the robot, because, first of all, it's fearless, <laughs> <laughs> and, and it, it just does what it's told, and it's just, you know, just dedicated and, and pretty much can, pr- can do anything you want. It, it just makes the overall investigation very, very well-rounded. So it, it, it makes it beyond what I, I suspected, I, I expected. I originally did it as an experiment, but I had no idea it was going to come out to be this amazing uh, um, machine that, that functions really well. So, so that, that's been a blessing. So the long story short regarding the house in Rialto. Um, I called up the realtor and I said, hey, you know, you're, you're gonna, I got this great footage of this upper torso of this humanoid. You think you got to see it, you know, I, I got to show it to. You. And she said, I'll get back to you. That was the last time I talked to her because after that, she could not talk to me on the phone because it interfered with her trying to sell the house. <laughs> if, she, if she saw the video and she couldn't deny in court that she saw something and so that was the last time. So that was an interesting educational experience for me because I'd never dealt with a realtor before. But it's also uh, kind of a validation that we got something worth paying attention to. Right, right. Yeah, that's, that's fantastic. Now, do you, how many investigations have you done? I have no idea. Um, okay. I've been doing it since uh, the late 90s. Oh, okay. And and I've been uh, I've been to I was at uh, some ruins in in London, uh, Roman ruins, doing an investigation. Um, I've been all over the place, so you know I have I have no idea. Uh, but but I could tell you this: you do more investigations than you gather data. Data is rare, and you have to do everything you can to narrow that window so that you're not doing these these needle in a haystack investigations because that'll wear you out. It's kind of like, I think paranormal investigation is kind of like losing weight. You know, <laughs> let me tell you why. Okay. <laughs> you know, when you're on a diet and you don't lose that much weight, you get really discouraged. And sometimes you get so discouraged, you, you give up on the diet. Well, paranormal investigation is like that. When you're going out on cases over and over and over and you're not getting anything, it gets really discouraging. But when you gather something, even little tidbits, that fuels and gets you excited for the next investigation. So it's important to not just go out and do the shotgun effect trying to find something. It's important to limit, to narrow your, your choices to something that is uh, increasingly probable to discover something. And that way, when you narrow your, uh, get rid of the things that, that probably will be uh, a distraction and focus on something and that was high probability of capturing something, that's when the chances of finding something 
uh, increases, and when you do find something, it excites you for the next time, and then you find something else, and it kind of feeds on itself, kind of like losing weight in your diet. When you start losing some weight, you get excited, and you keep pressing on, and, mm. and it fuels the next time, and you keep losing, and you get in great shape. So you become a great paranormal investigator. Right. Nice and trim, too. <laughs> <laughs> do, do you do you have any of this stuff up online anywhere where people can see it? Um, I posted the robots um, up on um, uh, uh, I think the art bell site, but I haven't posted the video because, uh, as I was sharing with you before, um, I just finished fi filming a, a pilot, you know, for um, a possible television show. Mm -hmm. So some of the the video is part of that. Okay. So I haven't been able to release it to anybody. I really would love to because I just want people to see it. But I do show it at uh, lectures that I do. And um, I am doing, um, I do still do lectures, and, and I'm doing one in Southern California um, on the 15th of, uh, of next month. And, uh, no, I'm sorry, the 8th of next month at the Orange County Psychic, uh, uh, Orange County Paranormal Psychic Research Society. So at these, these, and I'm doing something in Laguna Beach also, if people write me and they email me, I will definitely share with you what I'm doing. And at these particular uh, lectures that I do, I do show the, the data uh, that uh, no one has ever seen before. Nice, nice. Okay, uh, in the book you, you talk a lot about how people shouldn't be afraid of these experiences that there's nothing really to fear except it's, it, except your own fear fear itself um when you investigate the paranormal have you ever encountered something that's just out and out negative oh yeah definitely um and that, but the thing is is that i learned something over um a period of this period of time the, the you know since i've been doing this is that just because we can perceive it negative doesn't mean it is and, and, and there are certain things that trigger us jumping to that conclusion. Um, like, 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 for instance, I did an investigation in um, uh, Palmdale, California. And what it was was I got a call from the, a mother of this 13-year-old girl who said that something is scratching and attacking her daughter, and it's unseen, and it's terrifying the whole family. So on its face something attacking and scratching the daughter, you hear that or you see it and you are, you, you, you know, the average person is going to think that's negative, right? Right. right. Yeah. It, it just, you know, without, it's a no brainer, but it, it, but that's the problem because what we're, when we're dealing with the paranormal physical, and, and this is the example that I give, I had a 150 pound giant breed German shepherd, um, that had from a puppy and he grew up he was an immense dog wow. beautiful black just beautiful so big when i would walk him down the street people would actually pull me up pull over and say oh my god what kind of dog is that and i'd say it's a german shepherd and they, i've never seen a dog that big before he was, he was gigantic well he was so big and he loved me and he was a, and he wasn't vicious it was a teddy bear he was so big that when i would lean down to hug him his big head sometimes i and it happened to me twice he would turn his head to look at me just as I'm leaning my head down, <laughs> and his head was so big, and his tooth would hit me in my lip, and it busted my lip twice. Wow. I know my dog wasn't trying to hurt me. Right. I'm positive about that. I'm positive it wasn't something negative. But because of his brute strength and my frail body, <laughs> that's what happened. So just because... You run into something unknown, paranormal, and it may cause a scratch, let's say, or draw blood, let's say, doesn't necessarily mean that it's negative. It just may mean that we have this force contacting a frail object and there being some kind of injury, but not that it meant to happen. Not all, I'm not, this is not absolute now. But this is how you have to be cautious in jumping to conclusions on when you get evidence that someone may have been, you know, slightly injured or, or marked or bruised even. It doesn't right. necessarily mean that it's negative. And if you take it as negative, it's going to set the tone for everything you do thereafter in the investigation and maybe contaminate the results and you end up being off on the wrong, you know, in the wrong direction.
Right. right. And plus, they all, you know, as, as the saying, uh, something like the saying goes, uh, what's good for the mouse isn't always good for the scorpion. What's good for the scorpion isn't always good for the mouse. Right. Right. And then, you know, we're frail. I mean, think about um, uh, lion tamers and people who play with even more powerful beasts. How many times do they get injured? Yeah. All the time. Uh, uh, sea World, uh, playing with the killer whales or something, they, they get injured. That's, but they, because they have this certain framework of understanding, they don't jump to a negative unless it actually, they can, they know what negative behavior is from, from these animals. Right. But when you're dealing with the unknown, the paranormal, we have no idea. We don't have a clue of what these things are capable or not. We don't know. So when it manifests something that, as a child, we've grown up to know as a negative, like drawing blood or a bruise. That's where, where else are we going to jump to? What, what other conclusion are we going to logically jump to based on our experience? Now, um, do you think that there's going to be some sort of, uh, like more and more people are leaning toward this sort of uh, grand solution that's this for all the paranormal, that somehow all these things are going to tie together, that UFOs, ghosts, uh, even Bigfoot and things like that are all going to end up having sort of the same source. Do you see that in your investigations? I, I, yes, I think, I think a lot of that is going to be narrowed. I think a lot of it is going to be uh, 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 related and connected. Uh, I think once we remove those limitations that I set up, that I talked about as far as linear time, forward and back, once we get rid of those, I think a lot more is going to start making a lot more sense. I think a lot, when we start understanding dark matter and dark energy, because right now we, those are just labels of something for something we don't understand, but when we can understand why they do and behave like they behave, why are these stars and galaxies racing away from each other at an accelerating pace, which doesn't make sense to the laws of physics because the gravity should be slowing them down and they should be slowly coming back. Why, when we start understanding why all of those things happen, then we can start understanding the, the paranormal, which will, and I really believe eventually we're going to take the para, para part off of it and it's just going to become normal. Right, right. Well, like anything we don't understand. Right, right. But we have to, we have to remove the limitations. When we, when we do that, uh, you know, when we say, hey, Columbus, you can't go sailing out there because the world is flat. You're going to fall off the edge. What do we do to ourselves? Yeah. We limit ourselves. So, you know, uh, saying two, three hundred years, six hundred years, when we, that's saying the world is flat to me. So I, I don't look at it that way. And I think the, when we stop doing that and start thinking, I mean, I'm looking back now to the Big Bang. I mean, it, it, because uh, we're walking around here now. Uh, uh, those of us who have gold rings or gold uh, uh, bands on our fingers, that gold didn't even originate on Earth. That gold originated in a star, maybe even a second generation star, millions and millions and maybe even trillions of years ago. Hmm. So, it, and, and our, our, the molecules that make up who we are didn't originate 600 years ago. And then we're talking about when did we become, start being ghosts? A million years ago? Well, if the solar system and the planet and all that is millions, the Earth is like, what, four point three billion years old? Yep. I mean, if, if the Earth is that old and we are of the Earth and of the stars, then aren't we that old or older? Right. right. So that's the thing is when you got it, we, I think we have to start going back and back and, and remove that limitation and say, okay, were we there before the Big Bang? Now, we don't even know if the Big Bang really exists. That's, a, that's another catch-all for an unknown. Right. But when we, whatever we are, which I tend to believe that we were, whatever we are, existed before that time. So if we can look at start looking at the full story, the, from and how how um, I mean, just think about this. I think it's amazing in itself that a star forms out of debris, collapses, burns for mil trillions of years or millions or billions of years, and then creates heavy metals and, and leads and, and uranium and, and different properties out of hydrogen and fuses it together, then explodes 
and it goes out into the universe and is reborn in another solar system. That happened here with our son, with Saul, our son. So if that happened, and we were a part of all that in the beginning and still are, that's when it starts becoming, I think, more illuminating and, and we start really leaning toward understanding who and what we really are and why the heck are we even here. <laughs> well, yeah, and it comes down to what came first, the, the spiritual plane of existence or the material plane of existence. Exactly. And, and, and you know, I mean, um, God bless every and people who, who embrace re their religious beliefs. I never try to alter or change that. But the thing about it is, you know, yeah, let's say, yes, there is a God, because personally I, would, I do believe, but not, not, maybe not the kind I was taught, because we didn't understand that. Mm -hmm. We can't even, for, and, and it's really, if you think about it, how, if, if there is a God uh, that created this universe and the system of blowing up stars and all that stuff and making this metal and, and us evolving and all that, can we even possibly comprehend it with these feeble brains that we have? Yeah. How can we barely, we can barely understand, you know, space travel to the moon or to this little tiny solar system? How could we even, I mean, uh, there's more galaxies in the universe than there are grains of sand on Earth. How can we begin to comprehend that vastness? Yeah. So, so the limitations of something that powerful, we don't have a clue. You know, but there is something going on, and there is definitely a spiritual aspect to it. So if anybody, it doesn't matter what you believe, yes, there is something going on, and that should bring you enough ha happiness right there and peace of mind. We just have to discover uh, what's going on and, and our roles and, 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 and maybe how the future um, uh, relationship we're going to have with it. Okay. And... Uh the other thing is that, that it may be that time, I've always wondered if time is something we only experience here. Well, time is based on movement, right? Right. I mean, the, 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 sun, the Earth moves around the sun 365 days. That's why we have 365 days in a year. The Earth revolves around its axis every 24 hours. That's why we have 24 hours. That's what time is based on. Or, or there's a pulsar out you know, a few, few uh, million light years away that pulses at a regular basis that we develop, that we use to measure time. That's all time is. Without all that, and if we didn't age, there wouldn't be any time. If there wasn't any movement, there, there would be no time. Hmm. So, so time is a very limited, as a matter of fact, um, Einstein has already proved that uh, time and space can be distorted and warped. Right. So, time is not rigid, and 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 in, and it says it's not rigid. It, it doesn't exist in all places, too. You know, hmm. but it seems to be that we, uh, uh, these souls that we are, these cosmic souls that we are, are capable of transcending the physical and existing in a non-physical, timeless state. Yeah, and and you know that's thing you hear too in near-death experiences where people see, say that time seems to function differently or they experience it completely differently in that state did you ever have well, that, that happens in the out of body experience too that's what i was going to ask think, you yeah you can think you're having a, an out of body experience that was you know 20 minutes and it may have lasted three hours hmm. or vice versa you know you may think you were out three hours and it was only 20 minutes so <laughs> time is irrelevant um also with experience on even um, um, time regarding, you know, like I was able to go to that doctor's house and see what, she, what was going on in her house in real time, but that's not, you're not limited to here and now. You can move, I mean, I've had other experiences that I list in my book that, that are forward and back, you know, and I, and I don't recommend people explore, project too much forward because things can happen that you'll have to learn to deal with. But exploring the past is very illuminating, uh, especially when we're talking about uh, reincarnation. Hmm. Okay. And do you, do you think that the, the future is static, or do you think that there is a sort of probable world thing going on? A little bit of both, and, and this is why I say that. You know, I don't think it's etched in stone. We do have free will, and our free will can control, control the future. But there are 
you know, and this goes into the metaphysical aspect of things and, and based on my experiences, is what I've discovered is there are certain experiences that I've already agreed to have when I came here hmm. that are going to be, I'm going to be guided toward experiencing. So it's not like I'm being forced. I've already made that agreement, and how I deal with these is going to be the variable. For the future, so so, if I have them, then you possibly have them, and everybody has them, and I can't interfere with yours because that's for you, because that's what you decided to do. So there, in that regard, there are some things that are going to happen that are going to give us an opportunity to adapt, evolve, and grow. All right. You're on WVBR FM Ithaca. This is Where Did the Road Go? We've been talking with Albert Taylor. So one last question for you. Have you ever tried to jump to future lives as opposed to past lives? Yes, and I, I, I remember uh, talking about that several years uh, uh, ago, and I discovered, and this is why I, I caution against this, because whether you think it's real or not, when once you open a can of worms, it's open. And there are some things that have to happen. Like I said, there are some lessons that need to happen. And I tried to change some things that I saw. And all it did was cause me more and more frustration. And it all manifested that way because it wasn't necessarily just about me. It was about other people and other lessons. So there are some things that are going to happen. I don't re recommend that. You can if you want. Usually people go into the, the want to know more about the future because they're, they're experiencing fear right, anyway. Right. So, so it's not a good foot to, to start off on. <laughs> um, if you really want to know how you got to this moment in time today and the second, then exploring the past is a good way of doing that. Well, I mean, but not just your life, but like a future incarnation. Have you ever tried to go that way? No, I haven't yet because of hitting my head on, on what I've already done. Uh, okay. All right. <laughs> All right. Know, it's like a dark tunnel. You keep going down that dark tunnel and you bump into a couple of things. You might want to turn around and come back out the tunnel <laughs> or, or, or don't do that. <laughs> All right. So the book, the book is Soul Traveler. It was originally published in uh, 96, but it's still available, right? Uh, there, it's the first version, 96. Uh, Penguin, Putman, Dutton, and the best-selling version in the year 2000. That's the one that's available. That's the best-seller. Okay. Okay. Are they the same book or? It's uh, the no. The latest one was the same book with uh, an epilogue and a lot more. The, the current one. Oh. Okay. All right. I think I have an earlier version. I have Verity Press. Yeah, that's the first 1996. Second is 1998 hardback from uh, Dutton, and then the third, which is the bestseller, was 2000, and that has the additional information and the epilogue and all kinds of other stuff in it. Oh, nice. All right. And uh, you plan on writing anything else in the future? I'm working on um, what I may be titled The Cosmic uh, Soul uh, from um, The Big Bang to Out of My Experiences and Beyond is a working title, and it has to do a lot with what I've already shared with you, and, and I want to touch on the meaning of life. Okay. All right. And where can people find you online? Um, they can they can go to albertaylor.com and email me from there, which is the easiest way, or you can email me directly at s o l t as in Tom R A V L E R at aol.com. It kind of looks like Soul Traveler, but the easiest way albertaylor.com and there's a link. Okay. Uh, do you have any Facebook pr uh, pages or anything? Pardon me. Do you have a Facebook page or anything? Oh, you're cutting out on me. You run one more time. <laughs> do, you, uh, do you have a Facebook page? Oh, man. I, you Facebook. cut out on me. You know. oh, 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 Facebook. Yeah, Albert Taylor on Facebook. Yeah, you can you come there and, uh, and, and uh, I'll befriend you and you can see all the interesting things that I post. And, you know, I'm a big Walking Dead fan, so be prepared for that. <laughs> All right. Well, I thank you so much, Albert, for spending this hour with us. And uh, as I said, as I told you before, I love the book. And now I'm going to have to get that, that third edition. Well, you know, it's been a pleasure. And um, as information, as I continue to do more research, if you're interested in hearing and seeing some of that, maybe posting some for your listeners, I'd be more than happy to do that. That would be awesome. And uh, hopefully we can have you back on sometime in the future. That sounds good to me. All right.